when I came to that realization and admitted it to myself, I went back to my little room in, in San Francisco and talked to the Major D. Now he had died in the meantime, he didn't show up, but I talked to him and said, I am sorry. I didn't go to work for excellence. I went to work and I promised him it would never happen again. That from now on, I truly will remember what he told me, never go to work to work, always go to work for excellence. And from there on, my career took off like a rocket ship. Hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the World of Presentations podcast brought to you by us at Presentation Agency 356 Labs. My name is Boris, and I'm the host of this episode. And by the way, this is episode number 100. And so uh, we decided to make it slightly more special. So what do I mean when I say slightly more special? Well, we have a special, very special guest. With us today, we have Mr. Horst Schulze, who, to give you some context, is one of the founding members of the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company. It was under his leadership that the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company became the first service based company to be awarded the prestige Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award not once, but twice. What's more, after leaving the Ritz Carlton Hotel, uh, uh, Hotel Group, um, Hotel Company, Mr. Schutze went on and found the Capella Hotel Group. And in case, in case you don't know anything about Capella Group, let me just say that their hotel in Ubud, Bali, won the award for number one overall hotel in 2020 and numerous other awards. Last but not at least, Mr. Schutze accepted our invite to be one of our speakers at the upcoming Present to Succeed conference in Naples. And I cannot wait to see him there again, because we are going to be talking about leadership and communication. We're going to do this even in this episode. And to be very honest, I have to uh, probably go silent now. Uh, Mr. Schulze, uh, thank you again for accepting both our invites to be here with us today in the podcast and about the conference. Delighted to be with you. Let's start with your story first and get our listeners familiar with who you are and how did you end up in the hotel industry? Well, my, my, my story is very simple. I, I actually come from a small town in Germany. I started to work in the hotel business when I was 14. In fact, I left home. My parents found a good, in the shop in the best hotel in the region. That was 100 kilometers away at that time and that was far. I worked in a hotel. I was lucky. I had a wonderful gentleman, the maitre d, the head waiter of the hotel, who was a person of excellence. And the first day I came to work there, or the, before I came to work, he said, tomorrow you start at seven o'clock in the morning. And he made it clear, not one minute after seven. If I meant at 7.01, I would tell you so. Seven o'clock. And don't come to work. What do you mean don't come to work? He said, come here to create excellence in what you're doing. Now, with 14, that went right over my head, you can imagine. But after two years or so, I learned what excellent means from this gentleman who never did anything without trying to do the very best of it. So, and he, in fact, when I left there, I a, there's an interesting story a little bit here. When I left there after three and a half years, I went to work in Switzerland at the time. He said, look me in the eye, never go to work, to work, always go to work for excellence. I promised him that. And I done worked in, in, in Switzerland, in Holland America Line, in Paris, in London. And then I went to the US. I worked in Switzerland, in, in in San Francisco, in the Hilton Hotel, as room service waiter. And now, in the meantime, the Medici had died and so on. And my plan was I would go back to Europe after a year, but I wanted to be promoted first to room service supervisor. I knew that was possible because the manager of room service was German too. 
I had an inn, and I knew I was a good waiter. But soon another young man got a promotion, not I. That was devastating to me. And I was, my ego was hurt, and I, I planned on that. I, I was sure that I would get a promotion. It took me a few months to admit the young man who got the promotion deserved it more. And here's what I saw. I was very young at the time. In the evening, I partied. I had a good time. I came to work in the morning. A few minutes late, only a few minutes. I looked tired. From 100 meters, you could see that I was tired. And, and when, the, when the boss said, do this side work over here, like folding napkins or whatever, I said, why me? No, why not them? And so on. The young man that got a promotion always came to work in time. He came to work happy. He said, I'm happy to do things. When I came to that realization and admitted it to myself, I went back to my little room in in San Francisco and talked to the Metro D. Now he had died in the meantime, he didn't show up, but I talked to him and said, I am sorry. I didn't go to work for excellence. I went to work and I promised him it would never happen again. That from now on, I truly will remember what he told me, never go to work to work, always go to work for excellence. And from there on, my career took off like a rocket ship. So excellence was always, became part of my life because of this matter D who had great impact on us. You know, we are all the, the result of impact of many people, hopefully of good people. I was lucky for, to have that, that human being impact me in a very positive way. Great. My next question, however, is not the one that I really wanted to ask based on my plan, but I recently heard that you really care about be people being very disciplined or punctual, should I say. And I heard the story where you were describing the fact that if you have set a meeting for, let's say, 4 p.m., that means 4 p.m. and not 4.02. And if someone tries to enter in the room at 4.02, the door was already locked and you would lock that door. Tell us a little bit more about that. The door is closed, yes. Well... It, it, we have to understand, we have to, there has to be a, a certain discipline at work. And timing is a very important issue today. For, uh, because if you're not timely in your business, you lose, you lose uh, confidence by customers. You, you lose trust. You have to be very careful. You know, the customer, your customer, your guest, wh whoever that is, you call them, whatever you call them, you call them patient, guest, patient, whatever. They have three expectations in, you, in them. When they buy anything from you, it doesn't matter what they buy from you. It doesn't matter. It can be a hotel stay, or it can be a radio, or a car, or a bottle of water. There are three subconscious expectations that we all have. Number one, we expect the product to be defect-free. If you buy a bottle of water, you want nothing to swim in there. That's an expectation. You don't think about it, but that is a deep subconscious expectation. Number two, you want timeliness. You want it when you want it. Very important to understand. Number three, you want the people who give it to you be, to be nice to you. Those are the three expectations. And they're very strong. And timeliness plays a major role here. Because even if you do everything, if you're not timely, there is that creates distrust. I I don't I didn't develop that. I, I started that with behavioral by behavioral scientists. They tell you that. So I try to teach everybody, take timing serious. So yes, I have I, I work very precise. I expect when I said eleven uh, uh, four o'clock, I mean four o'clock. My my mentor D taught me that the first day I came to work. That's what you do. Oh, hopefully more people will hear this one. I personally care tremendously about being on time. That's why we actually, inside of our company, 356 Labs, we actually have a KPI that we are measuring around the fact that everyone should be prepared and coming to the meetings that they have always, always, always on time, no matter what the meeting is for that matter. Now, let me switch gears and 
just talk a little bit about something that truly amazed me in your book that's called Excellence Wins, where you talk a lot about customer service. Isn't it surprising that still in 2022, organizations out there globally, I would say, and I'll be curious for your opinion, um, many organizations out there differentiate themselves by just being and showing to their customers that they, that they truly care. Isn't that what everyone expects to be the default behavior in companies? Sure. 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 That is, that is an issue of relationship. You see, you, what do you want from, what do you want to accomplish as a business? You want to be sure that your customer becomes loyal to you. You become, lo they have to become loyal to you. Well, what creates loyalty? Is it the product? No, it's not the product. Think about it. Stay with a simple item like the bottle of water. If I buy that bottle of water from you, you are a small store. I come to you and I buy that bottle of water. It is fine. And you give it to me, give it to me timely. But at the same time, you are not nice to me. I will not come back. But if you, if I feel that you really respect me and like I'm nice to me, I will come back to you. You see, Here's the, here's the point in a big way. We must understand, we sometimes don't accept that we must understand the fact is, this is fact, the product will not create customer loyalty. It's the relationship that creates customer loyalty. It's that moment of relationship that creates customers to be satisfied and loyal eventually to you or not. It's not the product. Because in most cases, they can buy the same product somewhere else. And here's a very fascinating study. It's a pretty new study. Very important. I hope people hear me. The, the market as a whole, 70% of the market that purchases anything says, I will deal with you if you give me good service. Even if I could buy the same product next day, next door for less money. But if you give me good relationship, service is relationship. We have to understand that. If you give me good relationship, I will deal, deal with you. Why is this? That is very simply, this is because it's the relationship that creates trust. And once I trust you, I deal with you, even if I know. I can buy it for less next door. I know. Now here's a, here's a key element here. 70% of the market say so. Well, wait a minute. 80% of the millennials say so. And pretty soon millennials are all your customers. And 80% of them say, I will deal with you if I can trust you because you care for me and give me good relationship. Very important. And that relationship is manifests itself simply by serving the customer right. And, and, and allow me to break this down for a moment so we, we understand what is service. Everybody talks, we are the service, because we are this. Banks, everybody says it today. And 30 years ago, nobody said so. Today, everybody. Well, and if you ask them what is service, they don't, they don't define it. Service starts the instant not a half a second later, the instant you make contact with the customer, if that is on the telephone, in person, or in fact, on the computer. If the, if the first impression is a good one, I'm going to get positive. With other words, the personal service starts with a welcome. Welcome, good morning. By the way, it doesn't start with, hey. Hi means we are equal. But if I going to say to you, good morning, sir, how are you today? I'm saying to you, I respect you. But at the same time, I'm identifying that I'm professional. So then that's important. So this, that's the first step of service. The second step of service is to comply to your needs and wishes. That means it's not about me anymore. When I'm facing you, my customer, or my guest, or my patient, or whatever you are, It's not about me, it's about you. It's now my making an effort to help you to make the best decisions about my product. And the third step of service is saying farewell. Thank you for allowing me to serve you. If I do this excellently, 
and you see caring for you means relationship if i do this excellently and i do it more than once you become loyal because you start trusting me and so you know we imagine that and some of you will now say the people that hear you well it's different in my business uh, 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 uh. this was a market-wide survey very carefully down done any any in any business if people trust you they're willing to buy from you even if you charge more yep indeed so interesting that just being nice which then leads to trust as you mentioned can be the reason why people decide to pay more for a service now i want us to go back to ritz scout and everyone knows ritz scout and hotels However, not everyone knows about Capella Group, I'm afraid. What is Capella Group and how come? What was the reason uh, for its founding? Well, as you know, I, I was the founder operationally. I was not an investor or, or developer. I was hired by investors and developers. They had two hotels in construction. They were not open to join me and run, join and run that company operationally. I joined them and, and we opened our first hotel a little bit a year later in Atlanta, Georgia. And my intent was to create the finest hotel company. I had been vice president operations, food and beverage for the United States for Hyatt. So I, I didn't need a job. I joined them for a dream, for a vision, for a purpose to create the finest hotel company in the world. And sure enough, uh, it's only four years later, we were awarded best hotel company in the world. And that was true for all the years that I worked for the company. So, but after 20 years, nearly, I was traveling 250 days a year. My wife said, it's enough. She had said that for a few years. And besides that, the painting was painted. It was I just, I could add another hotel, it didn't matter. So I retired on a Friday. It was enough. And on a Monday, I went to my wife and said, I'm going to start one more time. She got very angry for a moment <laughs> and, and said, what's the matter with you? And I said, I have this dream about starting an ultra luxury hotel company. It was clear at the time in any product, the markets were changing from luxury to affordable luxury and ultra luxury. And I wanted to be the first ultra luxury hotel company. Now there were many ultra luxury hotels, individual ones, the Plaza Arden in Paris, the, 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 the Claridge's in London and so on. But there was no hotel company that was ultra luxury. I, so I started on Monday and started to create Capella in the ultra luxury. And, and what does it mean? Luxury hotels are still taking conventions on, even because the, the ultra luxury customer says, I don't like conventions in the hotel. So that meant smaller hotels, up to 100 rooms, but very high end, serving the very top of the customer that has very high demand. By the way, it doesn't matter what market you serve, as long as you are the best in that market segment. So I wanted to create something in the upper market segment. I had worked in those hotels, the Borwash Palace in, in Lausanne, the Belleville Palace in, 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 in Bern, the, the Place Arden in Paris, the, the Savoy in London. I wanted to bring that into a chain, into a group of hotels. So I started Capella very, very successfully. And those of you who, most of, many of you have seen a Capella because you may have seen President Trump meet Kim in, in Singapore. That was in a Capella Hotel. However, just so you all know, uh, I sold Capella Company two years ago, uh, but they're great hotels. As you said, Obud was voted best hotel in the world. The company was voted second best hotel company in the world. So it has been a very successful organization. In the meantime, I do consulting with many other companies, but not with hotel companies. Um, and, and we apply the same principles of service, attention, process management to the organization. And 
you know, let me let me talk about because I talked about them and, and I would not be right if I, I, I I'm, I'm talking about this relationship management with customers, which creates the loyalty. First of all, there are three types of customers. Guests, again, doesn't matter what you call them. There is the dissatisfied one. Watch out. They become terrorists against your company. They go on the on, the, on social networking and can destroy you. Then they're the satisfied one. They're satisfied with what you do, but they go next door if they think there's a better deal. Then there is the loyal one. The loyal one, as I explained earlier, because they trust you. Now, and that trust is again, and let me emphasize that, is created by relationship, by service. And on, now the product has to be good too. The, the, the product can't be lousy, obviously, but it is created by relationship. So how do you take this and work this? This is the big question. I, as you know, I, have, I always talk about excellence. Excellence is never an accident. It's always the result of high intent and, high, and hard work. In the case of, of, of Capella, I wanted again to create the finest ultra luxury hotel in the world. That's high intent. Now, now after I've set a high intent, I have to ask myself first, is that good for everybody? Is it good for the investors? It has to be, otherwise you have no business. Number two, is it good for the customer? Really good for them. It has to be, otherwise you won't have a business. Third, is this intent good for the employees? It better be, otherwise they will not be aligned. Number four, is it good for society? Once it is good for everybody, you have no, you have to decide how am I going to do it? But once you know your purpose, you also will identify how to do it. And, and the one thing is, of course, relationship. You have to have relationship. And, and uh, there has to be excellence in relationship. E excellence, by the way, in a thing is if it does well for what it was created. It's excellent. Excellence in the human being is doing, doing your very best in the functioning of your work. You're not perfect, but you're doing your very best. Number two, doing your very best relationally. Number three, doing your very best ethically and morally. Now, how do you improve that? That's the question. I, as a human being, I cannot stand still. Otherwise, others will pass me by. If I question myself every so often, hopefully at least once a week about my functioning, how could I function better? How could I do my job better and tweak it? But what about relationship? In my opinion, because it's so important to the success, it is essential. It is service, it is everything. It is the judgment of the world about you. It's your relationship. So I should ask myself four times, a, four times a day, how could I have done this better? If you have a meeting with guests, stand back and say, how could I have done it better? If you pass by somebody in the corridor or anywhere, how could I have said hello better? Ask yourself four times, tweak it, and pretty soon you will be an expert in relationship and you become an expert in your functioning. Continuous improvement. One of our values at 356 Labs to continuously and constantly fine tuning absolutely everything we do so that we make it even better. Mr. Schulze, our community here, the people that are listening or watching this one are people from the business world, HRs, salespeople, marketing people, IT people, designers. And they are here because as we like to say in the same way as um, because of the reason why we created our conference present to succeed. This event was built because of people that are being asked to present whether they like it or not. Can we, however, and can they, however, implement this mindset of continuous improvement in their presentations too? What do you think? 
in big situation like a board presentation, you have to ask yourself, do not wait a week. Ask yourself immediately, as soon as you can, as soon as you have a moment by yourself, question yourself, how can I do it better? How could I have done it better? Because after any time you miss pieces, you know, question yourself, because look, little thing like that. If I take, if I'm a waiter and I take the order from the customer, that is the moment of communication with the guest on the table. I should step back and say, how could I have done this better, this moment of communication? Because you see, in everything, if you say one word too many, you are obnoxious. If you say one, one, one word too little, you didn't seem to care. You have to find the right moment. And the only way you find it is you tweak yourself by stepping every time away and say, how could I do it better? If you pass somebody in the corridor, you, you, you could say, hi, hey, how are you? Or you will remind yourself, I should say, good morning, how are you? It's very nice to see you. Mind you, in all those moments, now please listen. In all those moments, you're defining yourself. Why not make it a moment of excellence, all moments? And that means tweaking yourself and creating the habit of being excellent at all moments. Being excellent at all moments. Write that down, everyone. Write it down. Mr. Schultz, going back to presentations again, you're currently working as a consultant, as a mentor to so many global, global organizations. Have you seen a meeting, a deal or something else being ruined just because of a bad or ineffective presentation or plain and simple ineffective communication? Well, <laughs> you see it all the time. You see it all the time. You don't see it once. You see it all the time. You, you, you see, it's not prep. It's not the, so much. It is, of course, preparation. I mean, I don't want to dismiss that. Don't misunderstand me. But is having created in yourself the, the normal reaction by teaching yourself how, how you respond, how you react to, to situations, stepping, as I said, after a confrontation, step back and say, how could I have handled that better? Particularly people throw, people mess it up in confrontational moments, when somebody disagree with you, instead of saying, this is interesting, explain that a little bit more, give them strong and say, I hear you, but here's my thought. But if you may immediately go again and so on, there's so many ways of learning how to deal better. And it, but you, it, when, when people really mess it up, if there is somebody who disagrees with their, with their thought, and immediately, that because why is that? Because uh, ego and insecurity sets in. You have to teach yourself how to react to, how to respond in those moments. Those are the board sessions and so on. But but in any uh, individual meetings, you you know this can happen. So how can I ask questions? How can I take the best out of them? How how can we find common common agreements together you see this this is but it's all you see that's the point those are all relationship things a board meeting is a relationship moment it's a relationship moment so that's why i emphasize the relationship piece that's why i said if you would teach yourself and everybody will agree with that you cannot disagree with that four times a day you will be better but nobody does it that's why it's such a beautiful thing that you can stand out if you do it. Wow, that is so strange to hear also from you because with everyone that we communicate or the people that we create presentations for, the people that we train, the people that we engage with after and before and after actually at our event present succeed, we always like to say that the bar for presentations is set so low that everyone that does just a little bit just a little bit, not a lot, but just a little bit immediately differentiates from everyone else out there globally. Again, it's great to hear that you are also sharing that opinion. Now, I'm curious, can you 
share an experience? Can you share a situation or a case study where someone from the people that you work with or that you consult have mastered or became extremely good at communicating? And just because of that, uh, yes. they won't big, as people say. There you are. I, I give you an, 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 un, an unusual ex example. I work with a medical group called ShenMed. In fact, uh, uh, Fortune magazine just wrote that that group is changing healthcare, uh, uh, changing the future of healthcare. What did we? What do we do different? We have regular practitioner doctors. Now, now let's see this. Now this is a great example. You go see a doctor, and you come back and you have an opinion. And you say that's a very good doctor. You don't know anything about medicine. You have no really idea. Why will you make a decision as a good doctor? Because he had the right relationship with you. He informed you, he listened to you, or what he or she, of course. So that's why you, that's where your decision. So the decision of the patient world about the doctor has nothing to do with the medical because we don't know it. We have no idea if he gives us the right treatment. But we think so if he had the right relationship with us. And our our whole effort was to work on that relationship, do the right medical, but also do the right relationship. But because it itself will help healing if you have confidence in the doctor, will help the healing. So we taught, we, we taught that, we work on that to really care for them. And then we said, how can we care more of the patient and so on and really seek how can we be of true service to them? And today we started with a very small group. Today we have we have over a hundred uh, places, clinics. We are adding a hundred next year. And as I said, Fortune magazine said we are changing, we are changing the future of healthcare. And, and what did we add? We added real relationship and caring for the for the patient. Yeah. So how do you bring that thinking into an organization? No, no, you have no, no. Here's the thing, though. If you have, if you run a company out there, you maybe first of all. You, you have to have the leadership to bring that in. Of course, the leadership has to start with you. Leadership, when, when, when you talk about leadership, people always think about a boss somewhere. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, you, you. Start with yourself. But as a company, you have to bring that, you have to bring that relationship into people. That means you, 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 you have to, as I said, a great excellence start with high intent. And I also said, you have to make sure that your high intent for your company is good for the investor, good for the customer, patient, whatever, good for the employee and good for society. So, but, but what do companies do? They hire people, employees, to fulfill a certain function. Well, why, do I know? why do you do that? Why don't you hire people to join your high intent, to join you, to become part of you. Aristotle, 3,000 years ago, mind you, we know it for 3,000 years, said, said people cannot be fulfilled unless they have purpose and belonging. So why don't you offer them purpose? I I didn't hire people when I hired people to, to join uh, Capella or, 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 or for that matter, uh, uh, Ritz Carlton. I didn't hire them to fulfill a function. I said, join me for a dream. Join me to make this the finest hotel company in the world. But here you, but then I told them, here's, if we will accomplish that, here's how you will benefit. You will be respected. You will define yourself. You will have opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we hired. We didn't hire anymore. We selected to join us, to become part of a purpose. You see, the, the, the sad thing is all companies nearly hire people to fulfill a function. Oh, wait a minute. The chair on which you're sitting is fulfilling a function. We are hiring human beings to create, to be part of something and to be excellent. And then of course, 
the first day of work. What happens the first day of work? The first day of work, people, new company, tell pathetic speeches like we are a team here. How are your team? If you give them, don't give them purpose. Because a team is a group of people who help each other to what a common goal. And yet we don't give them a common goal. We let them fill out papers. We say we're a team and then we send them to work. The first day of work, we, in our organization, we explained who we are. What is our purpose? We invited them again to be part of it. We showed them the beautiful dream that we have to become the best, how it would be wonderful for everybody. Join us, be part of this, and here's who we think, what we feel. Here's what our customer wants from us. Connect them, align them to you, the employees. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Love what you're saying about leadership and the fact that before you look at your manager or your boss, you need to look at yourself first. Absolutely brilliant. I'm interested to hear and to learn something else from you, however. You have been in this such an impressive roles for so long, and for sure you had to communicate with people from all over the world. Uh, Ritz Carlton is an, a hotel chain that exists everywhere, more or less. Thus, the communication probably was very, very challenging because presenters or public speakers or uh, business people who need to present again, uh, they know or hopefully they, they will now learn that the audience is the most important stakeholder in a presentation, as one of our colleagues from London says. And I'm curious, how did you navigate it, uh, that, that complexity having um, and just working with people from different nationalities, religions, etc. As running the organization, the communication, because mind you, with Ritz Carlton, we had hotels in five continents. So I had to communicate, first of all, we, com we communicated very one point, the, the service fundamental of the day. Every day, we had 20 fundamentals which today it may be fundamental number 12. If a guest asks for direction, do not point, take him there. We, that will be again repeated in 20 days. So in that message is given the same day in every hotel. Okay. At the same time, now to, in, in 20 days, that tomorrow is number 13, 14, 20 days is number, number 11 again. At the same time, we share, in each hotel, we share something new in the company. We sh or we share an important letter from a guest. We share that everywhere, the same day, the same comment. With other words, I wanted the same dialogue to take place in every hotel around the world at the same time. So I thought that I could, in, in, in a way, institute the same conversation and consequently the same culture in each in each hotel that was very important but but that was the same exactly the same however we had tw so we had 20 basics that were culturally we made sure culturally they're neutral because we worked in 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 Muslim countries and in Christian countries on the this and we have different, so for example, different idea. So we want to be sure that they're culturally neutral. When I traveled to speak to people, I had in, in my file for each country a do, a, a culturally do or don't. So I, before I even landed, I read this you have to be careful and not do in this culture. So I applied that, but my message about the customer or about the employee was the same. They were adopted, but I was, I was sure that when I spoke, and mind you, I, I was in another hotel around the world every day. I was traveling at the time 250 days a year, constantly somewhere else, but I wouldn't speak to groups or to meetings or to the employees without an, out respecting 
careful stuff that you should not say in a certain culture or do in a certain culture. Yeah. Okay. So taking those cultural differences, thinking about them, seeing how we can implement them and just incorporate them yeah. in our presentations is obviously, obviously a huge, yeah, huge yeah. deal, let's say. Yeah. You have to respect that. At the same time, you have to be clear about the culture of your organization. Your organization has to be very clear and you have to be, when, when you develop your culture of your organization, the culture of the organization, a culture, everybody talks about culture. A culture is the general belief of the organization, the general feel and belief of the organization. And I can direct that. That's why I directed that to, to, so that our general belief existed. If that was in Africa or in Asia or in Europe, in Berlin or in, 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 in Shanghai or in Philadelphia, it didn't matter. I had, to, that's why I gave the same messages that discussed every day. Yeah. So those messages were so that the culture stays intact and that everyone anywhere was hearing consistent communication all across. That's, that's, I would say super, super interesting. Lastly, I wanted to ask you about a story that you also again shared in another, uh, I would say a keynote, was it uh, for a manager? I think it was in Boston, uh, who, did, who didn't meet uh, their uh, KPI because of the weather or something that there was a reason. He explained something that um, like he found a way to excuse himself. Why didn't he meet that KPI? I guess you have experienced various situations like that where management and leadership roles are just complaining or figuring out why something won't happen. Uh, how do you personally handle cases like this and uh, cases like that? And why do you approach them the way you do? Because you have a very interesting way in how you responded, uh, in that case. Ah, uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, here's the point. Uh, let, let's see that first. What the, the, the. The model, if you will, of leadership is the leader will establish where the trouble go. My, my, my leadership, my vision, my purpose was to create the finest brand in the world, the finest hotel in the world. That was the vision. Now, now, so the leader first has, has a clear vision. The leader makes sure it's good for all concerned. Number two, the leader commits himself or herself to the vision. And it's not just a pipe dream. Oh, okay. No, I will accomplish this and make sure that everybody is committed. Make sure we must accomplish this because it's good for all concerned. Number three, you must initiate the steps that take you there. What will it take to get there? What do I have to make do? in my product superior to my competition. So I will become the number one. Okay. Now, now put a line below there and now write the word focus. And that is where people break down. They suddenly find a reason why it cannot be done or why it may be too difficult or why this so but everything. It doesn't matter. Once you can think about it, keep focusing on the vision and not on the reason why it cannot be done. That's not your business. As a leader, you have no more right to find excuses, period. So, and I gave an example of what you referred to. I know what you're talking about. That was a hotel in Boston. In, in small and large thing, once the vision is established, you keep on looking at the vision and not at the poor excuses. Everybody makes excuses. It's so silly. As a leader, you have no more right to make excuses. In this case, a simple vision. We wanted, we, we made a budget. I was sitting down with the general manager to make the budget of the hotel in Boston. Now Boston is pretty far north in America and very cold often. So I, so please forgive me in my, in my, the, so not, not now, sorry, please forgive me. So please forgive me. So I, 
we forecasted for January 69% occupancy in our hotel in Boston. That was clearly attainable. We looked at it because we looked at it on the arrival patterns and so on and so on. It was, it was attainable, clearly. And we did 55%. So I called, them, called the manager. What happened? And what did he say? Wow, oh, oh, Horst, Boston, ice, snow, storm, January. I said, yes, but I didn't call for the weather. I called about the budget that we missed. You see, what happened to him? He, he wasn't upset at all. He had a good explanation. He felt good in the explanation. The explanation has nothing for you. The explanation doesn't give you a gallon of milk or, or, or a scoop of ice cream, nothing. The success lies in the vision. The excuse gives you nothing. It makes you feel good for a moment, but it has no value whatsoever. So I, so I, I said, so he said, yeah, but that's, no, please. What, and I said, what about your competition? The Cobley Plaza, that was the competition at the time. Well, they were very slow too. Yeah, and he was very proud of it. I said, well, that, but that means they had rooms occupied. And I want to know why they didn't come to us. They didn't arrive on the airport and said, snow, ice. That means I don't go to the Ritz-Carlton. But, in, you know, if you give up on your vision, you miss the solutions. I have to look, why didn't it come to us? What will I do next year so I will get the business in, even if we have snow and ice? You, you keep on focus on the vision as a leader, not on the excuses. The excuses, ladies and gentlemen, the excuses will give you absolutely nothing other than momentary satisfaction of your ego and your insecurities. The, the vision and the value will give, the vision will give you values, successes, rewards, income, applause, everything. Mr. Schulze, our time is gone. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, once again. It was a privilege uh, to have you for our 100th episode. I was happy to be with you and look forward to next year's conference. Brilliant. Everyone, you can connect with Mr. Horst Schutze on his website, horstschutze.com. And you can, of course, find his incredible book, Excellence Wins, absolutely everywhere where books are being sold and purchased. In the meantime, yet again, thanks for listening. Subscribe to the podcast if you still haven't. If you're watching us on YouTube or if you're finding this somewhere on social media, like, share, comment, everything that you do. All of those little clicks matter and help us reach out to more people and share those messages with more people. And if you still don't know about Present to Succeed conference, which is coming up in April, where we are going to have again Mr. Koshut together with us, presenttosucceed.com. Thanks for listening once again. See you in the next one. God bless. Thank you very much. All the best to all of you.